you are about to see one of my favorite interviews in a long time. You might remember the name Naho Life because a couple years ago when he was 12, I interviewed him. He's a brilliant young man who's talking about his interest in music and apologetics. And even at one point, he expressed how he understands the ontological argument differently than William Lane Craig. Well, now he's in high school, and he's interviewing some of the leading thinkers on the origins of Christianity. People like Craig Blomberg, Craig Evans, Craig Keener, Michael Kona, Dale Allison. And he asked me if he could interview me about the deaths of the apostles. I'll be totally honest. These are some of the best questions I have ever been asked. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And while you're at it, make sure you subscribe to Nahoa's channel where you see him asking questions of some of the leading thinkers on the origins of Christianity. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the discussion. This channel is here to serve as a platform for scholarly discussions about some of the most significant questions regarding the history of early Christianity, the philosophy of religion, and systematic theology. My name is Nahoa Life, and I'm here to ask those questions, to seek truth openly and critically, and to share the journey with you. This first season is centered around the history of early Christianity, and especially the question of Jesus' resurrection. In conversations about the resurrection, one claim that's often made is that the apostles died for their faith. Today, we're going to talk about this claim and learn from perhaps the foremost expert on the subject. He has a double master's in theology and philosophy, as well as a PhD in apologetics and worldview studies. I say his PhD dissertation, as well as his 2015 book, The Fate of the Apostles, provide the most in-depth, comprehensive treatment of the subject. I was on his YouTube channel in early 2021, and that was such a blessing. It was an awesome experience, and it opened up so many opportunities. Uh, I've learned a lot from this scholar, so hopefully we can have yet another illuminating discussion. Dr. Sean McDowell, how are you? Nahoa, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on and super proud of you what you're doing on this channel. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's just get right into it, if that's all right. Let's, let's start off by asking, by asking about the significance and your main conclusion. So from your research, what does the evidence suggest about the fates of the apostles? And what do the fates of the apostles suggest about Christian origins? Well, partly what motivated me to research this is that I hear, had heard an argument that I know you've heard many times that all the apostles to their dying breath proclaimed that Jesus had risen, refused to waver even when they were being tortured. Therefore, their testimony is reliable. Christianity is true. When I was younger, I didn't give much of a second thought to this claim. I thought, well, that makes sense. People aren't going to die for something that you know they know is false. And it kind of felt like just a legitimate piece of the case for Christianity. Then as I got older, I started to think about this more deeply and frankly was challenged by an atheist friend of mine, needed a doctoral dissertation topic and thought, you know what? I can't believe nobody has looked into this in depth. I'm going to start doing the research. So when you do an academic research, the goal should not be to take this argument and make it as strong as it should be. The goal needs to be what is actually true about this claim and what can we conclude from it? And to make a long story short, we'll get into some of the details. I concluded that at least uh, hands down, there's no reason to doubt the disciples existed. They all believed they had seen the risen Jesus and then were willing to suffer for that belief. And then at least some of them died, I think arguably up to six with varying degrees of probability uh, for that conviction. They died as martyrs. Now, as I'm very clear in my research, this doesn't prove that Christianity is true. I think at best, it's one piece, not an insignificant piece, that removes the idea that the apostles are liars, that they invented the story, that it was a big conspiracy. Even Dale Allison, a more critical New Testament scholar, says this removes a claim that they just invented the idea that Jesus had risen from the grave. So we can get into more depth, but that's essentially where I think the evidence points. And if I remember correctly, you say Peter, Paul, and James, the son of Zebedee, their martyrdoms have the highest possible probability. James, the brother of Jesus, it's very probable that he was martyred. And 
Andrew and Thomas, their martyrdoms are more probable than not. Those are the six who have probable martyrdoms. Is that right? Yeah, so I would put Peter and Paul and James, the brother of John, son of Zebedee, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, in very high historical levels of probability. I actually rate Thomas and Andrew as more plausible than not. Meaning that's probably like 51% more likely than not. The others I just concluded are as plausible as not. So it's just as likely they were martyred as they weren't. The evidence in a sense is inconclusive. Yeah, and I appreciate that you make a more nuanced claim as opposed to the blanket assertion that all the apostles were killed for their faith and they wouldn't die for a lie. Therefore, mm. Christianity is true. There's a seedling of a good argument there, but it's not expressed with precision. Um, so we can go into what you do express and what you actually do say right now with this next question. So actually, here's a quote from your dissertation. Whether or not all the apostles actually died as martyrs, they all willingly proclaimed the risen Jesus with mm. full knowledge it could cost them their lives. The apostles proclaim the risen Jesus to skeptical and antagonistic audiences with full knowledge they would likely suffer and die for their beliefs. All the apostles suffered and were ready to be put to death, and there was good reason to believe some of them actually faced persecution. There is no evidence they ever wavered. So here's my question. If we have good evidence for only about half a dozen probable martyrdoms, then how can we say with confidence that all the apostles were willing to suffer and die for their continued profession of the resurrection faith? Isn't it the case that when it comes to most of the apostles, sources are either late, lacking, or legendary? So this question has two parts. First, is there positive evidence for the sincerity of the apostles who weren't killed? And second, how evidentially forceful is the lack of evidence uh, for their recanting? Great question. So let's take these one by one. So when it comes to the rest of the apostles, here's what we know. You just go to the beginning of Acts and Luke specifically lists each of the apostles in 113 by name. So he walks through all of them, of course, minus Judas. And so they're listed specifically by name. And then they start proclaiming this resurrection message in Acts chapter 2. And all the speeches throughout the book of Acts, by the way, it's about a third of the book. And at central to all these messages is that Jesus had risen from the grave. But very soon in Acts 4 and in Acts 5, what happens is the apostles start getting threatened. They get beaten. They get thrown in prison. And they're told to stop preaching this message about the risen Jesus and they refused to do so. So we have, at least at the beginning, I think arguably very strong from the book of Acts, the apostles putting themselves in harm's way, willing to suffer. In the early chapters in Acts, we have the death of Stephen. And then of course, in Acts 12 too, we have the death of James, the son of Zebedee, with full knowledge that they are following a crucified savior an enemy of the state, so to speak. They're getting threatened, beaten, thrown in prison for this, and they keep advancing this argument. In fact, that's a part of what Acts 1.8 is, that they would be witnesses to the ends of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. So Acts doesn't get us to the end of the life of all the apostles, but it does get us, as I carefully stated in my dissertation, a willingness to suffer and because their savior had been put to death at least minimally a willingness to die for this message from all of the apostles now how do we go further than that well that's where we have to piece certain things together and ask what is most probable so you can look at messages like paul for example in first corinthians 15 when he talks about if christ has not been raised the faith is in vain and then he says, we're found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ. And Paul is staying in the Corinthians. And this is in verse 14 and 17, right after he's laid out the key appearances to the apostles, that the message that is being proclaimed is tied to the resurrection. So that gets us now into the mid-50s. Now, what we can look at is the church fathers. 
and I won't walk through the list. This is, I walked through this on my dissertation, but from the end of the first century through the second century, there's at least eight or 10 that consistently say the apostles believe they'd seen the risen Jesus and they go proclaim this to the ends of the earth. So minimally with the other apostles, I think all we can argue is that they have a willingness to suffer and die, put themselves in harm's way for their belief that Jesus had risen from the grave. I think we can establish that even if like you say, and I write in my book, when it comes to their actual faith at the end, some were not exactly sure. Now, I think the second part of your question, I love that you have PowerPoints ready here, super impressed, way to go, is what about the lack of evidence? And I think the question becomes, if they had recanted, would we expect to find some evidence that they had wavered in their faith? And this is technically, you might say, an argument from silence. But I don't think all arguments from silence are equal, so to speak. We have to partly ask, would we expect, if this happened, to have some kind of record of it? That's a part of the question that I think we have to ask. And I think when it comes to the apostles, it's reasonable, at least more reasonable than not, to expect that we would. Why? Well, there's debates in the third, really, into the fourth century about what happens to Christians if they deny Jesus. Can they be restored back to the faith? Do they lose their salvation? Throughout church history, fathers taking different sides on this debate. It's amazing that there's not even a single reference. Well, what about Philip? What about Matthew? What about James, etc.? There's none. So you could argue that Christians might have some, some incentive to include this. But I'd also say skeptics would. I think this is true for Celsus, for Porphyry, for other skeptics throughout the history of the church. If they could find a way to delegitimize the Christian faith, they would. Now, what Dale Allison points out in his book is he says, the problem with like second century skeptics and critics like Celsus is that these are recorded by origin, a Christian source, and the Christians would not have incentive to record and report uh, such a thing as an apostle denying their faith. And that's a fair challenge. But I went back and I read uh, the book by Origen where he's responding to Celsus. And Origen doesn't pull any punches in terms of Celsus's charges against the doctrine of Christianity, against the character of Christianity, against the person of Christ. Origen reports some very tough claims that Celsus makes, and he responds to them, in part because Origen is trying to write to encourage Christians who are being challenged in their faith at this time. So it does him no good to make straw men of this uh, claim and ignore if there was some story about them recanting and not deal with it. So I think it's a fair charge by Allison, but I think it's it's kind of remarkable that we have no record of any of them wavering whatsoever. That doesn't prove anything, but that gives strength to what we have from Paul, what we have in Acts, what we have from the church fathers, that they believe they had seen the risen Jesus and go out and proclaim it to the ends of the earth. Yeah, that's very helpful. So if I can kind of summarize when it comes to the positive evidence for the sincerity of all the apostles, we have the book of Acts, which details their persecutions and and even in spite of the persecution, in fate, in in the face of suffering, they continue to preach the resurrection faith. You appeal to the early church fathers, um, and the apostolic fathers actually knew the uh, several of the apostles, Peter, John, and maybe Paul. Um, and you also look at Paul's epistles. And then for the lack of evidence against that point, you basically say we would expect if people knew about an apostle recanting or an apostle uh, abandoning their allegiance to Jesus, you would expect to see it maybe in Christians debating about the nature of kind of apostatizing, and you'd expect to see it in um, early cr cr critics of Christianity. Is that right? That was a great summary. I think you captured it. And expect, I think it's... It more likely than not that we would 
if there were such a story. There's not even a hint about it in either source. And by the way, we even have precedent within the scriptures themselves to include embarrassing material of the followers of Jesus. We see that in the Gospels. We even see Paul in Galatians calling out Peter publicly. So there's just not this consistent precedent to cover up difficulties in the faith that would warrant the conclusion that I think Allison comes to about Celsus in particular. Yeah, and we actually have the example of an apostle of Jesus abandoning allegiance to Jesus recorded mm. in, in Christian accounts, which is Judas, you know? So th they don't shy away. The gospel authors and Christian authors in general don't shy away from perhaps embarrassing details. And yeah, the example in Galatians where, you know, Paul rebukes and calls out Peter. That's a good, um, a good illustration of it. And also my friend Job on social media, he's Job Apologetics. Mm -hmm. um, he points out in 2 Timothy 4.10, I think, where Paul calls out a guy named Demas or something. Mm -hmm. Demas, who has um, loved the present world and deserted him and gone to Thessalonica. So, yeah, I, I think that's a fair response. And one thing about the book of Acts, and I might be misremembering this, but in Acts 4 and 5, for example, it's not all the apostles who are preaching and being persecuted. It's just Peter and John. So in the book of Acts, and again, I might be misremembering, but at the beginning, he mentions all the apostles and Peter's delivering sermons kind of in the name, like he's representing all the apostles. But then as the book progresses, they just focus on Peter and John and then Paul and Barnabas. So can you use the book of Acts as evidence for even the apostles who weren't the main ones? Yeah, I think you can, because the gospel wasn't just being preached through Peter and John. They're the examples that take the message out, out further. That's why John goes with him and Peter's going to places like Samaria. So to fulfill Acts 1.8, when they go to uh, Samaria, he specifically focuses on Peter and John who do that testimony. But if you look at Acts 1.8, what does it say? You are to be testimonies and you are to share this to the ends of the earth. That's why they replace one of the apostles in Acts chapter 1, because of the function of being witnesses to this. So it focuses on Peter and John. But it's not meant to imply at all that they're the only ones preaching this message. In fact, I think the earlier part of Acts is very clear that they all did, even though it focused on Peter and John. And then around you know, 12 and 13, it shifts to Paul. That doesn't mean the apostles stop preaching this message. It means that Paul is now the one that's advancing Acts 1-8, where he takes it ultimately to Rome. Yeah, that, that's a fair response. Um, and And... You could say it's possible that, you know, Acts ends and then after that, the apostles kind of lose motivation or they kind of say, I don't know if I really saw what I saw, but that would be ad hoc. That would be, there would be no motivation to suggest that. It's a possibility that you can't rule out, I guess, but it's not a very plausible possibility to be entertained. Is that right? I think that's right. You're making a key distinction between possible and probable. So if the apostles start fading out and aren't preaching this, then how is the message proclaimed to the ends of the earth? Why does the church grow so significantly? What accounts for this? Now there might be, and there were other apostles outside of the 12, but my goodness, where did they get their motivation from if the leading 12 that Acts highlights all of a sudden just disappears and stops? There's not a shred of positive evidence that that happened and I think good reason to doubt it. Yeah, that's that's very helpful. Um, maybe we could move on to the next question. So this question is kind of about the implications of voluntary suffering. So if you can establish that someone mm. is willing to suffer and die for what they say and do, I can think of five possible options, and I can pull them up here. So okay. there, there's five possibilities in my mind. I, I don't think, you know, all of these are more plausible than the others. I just suggest them as precedented possibilities. So um, the first one is sincerity, which is, you know, which is the motivation that you would ascribe to 
the apostles, and that's the reason why they were willing to suffer and die. But there are five, or there are four others, and so I'm thinking we could go through each of them and discuss them, um, starting with sincerity. Let's do it. So, s- sincerity maybe might be like the natural response. So, if you can establish that someone is willing to suffer and die for what they say and do, the natural thought would be, oh, they're genuine. There can be exceptions, but would you agree that kind of by default it would be, oh, they're sincere? Yeah, I mean, generally we trust people what they tell us. I mean, I don't assume people are lying to me when they speak unless I find some good reason to the contrary. And then if somebody is willing to suffer and potentially even die for what they're telling me, that makes me go, wow, that person really does believe it. Because frankly, a lot of people aren't willing to walk across the street for what they say they believe. But I think the rubber really meets the road when it costs you something. I mean, we see this on social media. People are willing to jump in and, you know, virtue signal and argue for a ton of things. But as soon as it costs us something, then you start to realize, okay, this person really believes it or they don't. Uh, so I part of making this case when it comes to sincerity is what were the apostles proclaiming? What was the heart of their message? And the heart of their message was that Jesus had risen from the grave and they had seen the risen Jesus. So especially given what that message cost them immediately, I think right away it's fair to at least assume at the beginning, barring a better explanation for their suffering, that they actually are sincere. Yeah, that's good. So sincerity, so choosing option one kind of, or attributing sincerity as the motivation of the apostles might be the default until you get a defeater or until you get a better rival hypothesis. Yeah? Yeah, I I, I think that's fair. And so generally I would approach that with anybody when they tell me something, I'm going to say, okay, I believe you give me reason to discount. So I think that's just a general principle. Maybe some people would be more skeptical and not believe anybody until they prove it. But I think that's a default way that I would approach it. And then when we start to narrow down with the apostles, what they're suffering for, what they claim, what it costs them, it just buttresses that claim of sincerity. So yes, borrowing a better explanation, the one they give us, the one Paul gives us, the one the early church fathers consistently give us. We have multiple lines of evidence saying this is why they're willing to suffer. It seems to be the most reasonable explanation. So let's maybe look at some of those other, um, you know, better explanations that or ideas that could be suggested as better explanations. So one of them would be a desire to be remembered or venerated as a noble self-sacrificial kind of martyr. So the example that came in my mind was Peregrinus in Lucian of Samosata's mm. second century Greek work, mm. The Passing of Peregrinus. And you know, Peregrinus is this philosopher who's kind of just described as wrapped up in his own narcissistic pride. And this pride, this desire to be remembered even after he's dead, it fuels him to sacrifice his life and jump into fire and just die. And so he was willing to, to give up his life for things that he claimed and did, but it, was, it probably wasn't because he was sincere, but rather because he had a desire to be venerated. So what do you think of that analogy and why don't you think it would apply to the apostles? So I, I, I'd say a few things. This is a great example is number one, I state very early in my dissertation that people are willing to suffer and die for a range of different reasons. Uh, it was Candida Moss in her book on the myth of persecution says that Christians uniquely claim to have martyrs. I don't know what Christians claim this. I willingly concede that there are Muslim terrorists who will die for their faith. There's Buddhists who would light themselves on fire. There were Jews who would suffer terribly as recorded in Maccabees for their belief in the law and that you shouldn't violate the law. 
So there are plenty of people who will die for some belief in some cause. What we have to ask with the Christians is, what was their belief in? Why were they willing to suffer and put their life on the line? And that makes it qualitatively different from all of these other examples, including Peregrinus, which, by the way, by the way, is written by Lucian in probably 160 AD. So about a century after probably most of the apostles died. It's really entertaining reading. It's online. It's not that long. At some points, I almost laughed. And I know you aren't supposed to when somebody is martyred. But Lucian is telling this story. And you're right. A co- all we have that I'm aware of is this record by Lucian. And he's telling the story that Peregrinus was a philosopher. He was a cynic. He was a Christian. He went through all these different belief systems. And at one point, he's even willing to suffer for his Christian faith. He's thrown in prison, but then gives it up and ultimately becomes a critic of it. Well, one of the things that Lucian points out, and again, this relies upon Lucian's account being reliable, is he paints Peregrinus as totally an opportunist who simply wants to be renowned and remembered forever, even when he's gone. This seems to be his motivation. So some of the things that uh, Lucian points out is that you know he's cremated, he jumps in this flame of fires at Olympia, so right at the time and place, there would be the most people there to pay attention and watch. He describes that he's all he's seeking after is notoriety in his life. Uh, he's compared to Zeus at certain points and even renamed himself the Phoenix because he would come out of fire and resurrect. If we're to trust Lucian's account, Peregrinus is concerned above all else at leaving a name for himself, creating a spectacle. And that's what he does by laying down his life. So at most, I I think the way Peregrinus describes this is that his death is just kind of a fitting conclusion for somebody who lived the life that that, uh, Peregrinus lived. And he's almost mocking him. So we have an account of him and we have a testimony that he laid down his life. And this testimony says he was a charlatan in a sense. He's seeking after notoriety. He's comparing himself to Zeus and the Phoenix and Socrates. This guy is above all else trying to leave a big name for himself. What's the best way to do this? Well, shortly after the Olympics, stage this huge spectacle, literally go down in flames. So I don't think when we look at the details of Peregrinus, it's a good reason to doubt the testimony of the apostles who, if anything, what was the message of Jesus? The message of Jesus Jesus was not venerate yourself, leave a name for yourself. It was to die to yourself and venerate Jesus. It's the opposite. So one is to die because he thinks this is the best way of getting notoriety for himself, Peregrinus. The apostles suffer because it's not about themselves. They fear God more than they fear men. So in many ways, I think when we break down the details of this, it only strengthens the case for the unique suffering and dying of the apostles. So Peregrinus concocts this whole story of what he thinks is going to make him a hero in the eyes of people. At that stage, believing the Christian message that a Messiah had been resurrected was mocked by the Greeks. Even Paul brings this out. That would not have been the way to create this lasting veneration uh, Mm. when you compare the two together. So I just don't think that idea of venerating themselves can account for the data we have of the apostles. Yeah, that's a really good response. So if I can try to summarize and encapsulate what you just said, um, the apostles' motivation for being willing to suffer was very different from Peregrinus's. Peregrinus, mm. or however you pronounce his name, Peregrinus, Peregrinus, um, his motivation was about himself. He would compare himself to a god or to a mystical creature. So he was wrapped up in himself while the apostles were wrapped up in, in Jesus. And their, I guess the center of their motivation was not themselves. And if it was themselves, you would expect them to proclaim 
a message that's more easy to digest, I guess. Not mm. something, not like a bodily resurrection, which was unheard of to most Jews and disliked by most Greeks. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really good response. I think you summed it up well. Bottom line, Peregrinus is asking, how does he raise up his name and be renowned and remembered like Zeus and Socrates? The apostles are saying, we're going to lay it all down to raise up the name of Jesus. Mm. Very, very different motivation. That's good. So next we can go on to number three. Um, this is, an, again, a possibility. I think of these five, it's the least plausible. But basically it would be something like this. The apostles lie. Like they, they start off with a lie. They say, oh, Jesus rose from the mm. dead. And then the reason they don't recant in the face of persecution, even when recanting would result in a less severe consequence, they just hold on to it out of stubbornness. And an analogy might be a criminal who refuses a plea deal. So admitting, hey, I messed up or I lied or I did this, it would, it would lessen as his severe consequence. But he refuses to. He refuses the plea deal just because he's stubborn. So why would you think that's disanalogous to the apostles? So I agree with you. This is probably the least likely one. Now, the way you frame this, though, is that if I heard you correctly, let's grant that they lied at the beginning. And then once they've proclaimed this message for so long, they realize we're kind of stuck with this. So they're stubborn. So they take it to the grave. Yeah. The problem is what's granted at the beginning of that. My question is, why would they lie? we need to account for that motivation in the first place. And that's the very thing that needs explanation and cannot simply be granted. So especially when you're following a savior who says, pick up your cross and follow me, uh, you're going to lose everything, uh, serve other people first, you're going to be an enemy of the state. Like when you start to break down what this message was in that culture at that time, I'm not going to grant that all of them just simply lied. Even if you grant the apostles, this group came together and came up with that, which I still don't grant. You still got to go, what about James, who wasn't one of the 12, the brother? What about Paul? You've still got to give some motivation to believe this in the first place. Now, I guess the other thing that strikes me as I think about it is there wouldn't be this stubbornness at the end of their life if all of a sudden their lives are being threatened, that's exactly what they would have signed up for. And they would have known this going into it because mm -hmm. they're following a crucified savior. John the Baptist, this forerunner was beheaded. You have precedent of prophets suffering in the Old Testament. You very quickly have Stephen. They're thrown in prison and they're threatened. Like it's not like they get to the end of their lives and are like, oh shoot. This actually costs us something. We might suffer for this. That was worked in the message. It's what they experienced at the beginning. So I guess as I think about stubbornness, and this is a really interesting challenge, it has to concede something in the beginning. I'm not willing to concede. And then it assumes at the end, all of a sudden, they find themselves in this situation that if they actually told this lie, they would have known they were going to experience that all along which brings us back to the original question, why would they proclaim this lie in the first place? And the interesting thing is around the time of Jesus, there's known to be at least 10 false messiahs and some of them died, but their apostles, what they do is they very quickly say, well, this was a false uh, prophet, let's move on built into judaism was this idea that there would be some false messiahs and a way to deal with them when they arose and so you have all these other lists of false messiahs and very quickly the apostles if he jesus wasn't the true messiah and they didn't believe they'd seen the risen jesus would have chalked him up to another failed messiah rather than saying, well, let's just say he was resurrected and then start suffering for this message. That's why the stubbornness one, amongst other reasons, just doesn't ring as 
plausible to me. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's fair. Um, so maybe let's move on to number four. And this, I don't know if it's the most plausible of options two to five, but it's I think it's the most interesting to me. And my friend Caleb okay. Jackson, uh, my friend Caleb Jackson, who was on Ca- uh, Cameron Bertuzzi's channel and Than's channel, Exploring Reality, he's at, like he's an expert on the resurrection and miracles. He mm. suggested this one to me, and I, I had never thought of it. So this one is basically su- it's suggesting that the apostles had an ultimate prior commitment to the cause of Jesus, and they were willing to do anything to get mm. people to that cause even if it means lying. So hmm. this one has them being sincere. It ha- it you know genuineness is their motivation, but it's not to what they preached, it's to the person that they were preaching for. So you know maybe an analogy could be Rahab, the uh, Rahab in the Old Testament who had this commitment to the God of the Jews and shielded the Jews when they were, you know, trying to be caught and was willing to lie for her ultimate commitment and then you could also look at some scriptures like first corinthians in first corinthians 9 where paul says i have become all things to all people that by all Mm. means i might save some and then in philippians 1 verse 18 i think where he says whether then in pretense or in truth christ is proclaimed and in that i rejoice so you can take those scriptures and you know kind of take them out of context as well and use them to support option number four. So, so yeah, what, I'm curious to see what you think about that. Okay, so this is a really interesting challenge, and I love that you and your friends are studying and talk about this and trying to think through reasonable explanations. It's awesome. So let's take uh, the passage you mentioned in, I think you said in Philippians, where Paul says, I become all things to all men. Well, yeah. But does that include lying and deception and a false message to do so? I think it's a little bit different with the case of Rahab. When her life is on the line and it's preserving it, she didn't choose to go out and proclaim this message like Paul did. And he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he is shipwrecked and he is beaten and he is starved. He is going out actively you might say bringing this persecution on himself offensively where Rahab is playing some defense. Those are different things. But I guess I would say when you say this, like Rahab had a commitment to the God of Israel and presumably uh, Paul had a commitment to the God of Israel and or Jesus. We still have to ask the question, what did that commitment entail? And if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then if they had a commitment, namely Paul, to the God of Israel, then his commitment would say, don't believe in this false Messiah and expose him. That's what it would have meant for somebody like Paul, who describes himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, zealous for the law. If he had this commitment to the way he described himself and he didn't believe that Jesus appeared to him, what he would have done is say, this is a false Messiah. This is not true and gone out and continued to persecute Christians who he thought were not being faithful to the God of Israel. I look at Paul and I think if Jesus in in the book of Acts, we have this story where Jesus, I'm sorry, where Paul is out proclaiming the message and he's being persecuted. Well, if Jesus really is not the Messiah, and these Christians are saying that he was, then Paul should stop that message. That's exactly what it meant to be faithful to the God of Israel. But if Jesus did appear to him, then he needs to go out and be willing to suffer and die for this. So if we go back to the original ultimate commitment that the apostles had, we have to ask what was their ultimate commitment? What was their ultimate claim? Their claim was that the God of the Old Testament has revealed himself through the person of Jesus, lived a sinless life, performed miracles, died, buried, rose in the third day, 
and appeared to them. So if they did not believe that Jesus had appeared to them, they're not proclaiming the ultimate cause of the God of the Old Testament. They're actually betraying that cause. Now, you didn't bring this up, but as you mentioned it, I think one reason people might miss this is because it's easy for us today, especially with liberal Christianity, to separate the good that Christianity did apart from the message of Christianity itself. So we see this with liberal Christianity and the social gospel. We can have this cause of Jesus, whether or not Jesus actually rose from the grave. His teachings can stand alone. That is a modern idea that would not have been entertained in the first century. The earliest account, and I document all this in my book, from all the testimony we have, whether it's the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, whether it's the Gospels, whether it's the kirgma, what was preached in Acts, is that the Christian message was, Jesus has forgiven your sins. Forgiveness has come to all. That's the heart of the message. And why do we have forgiveness? Because Jesus died on the cross and he rose the third day. So if they didn't really believe that Jesus had appeared to him, it guts the very message. And they would not have the ultimate commitment to the God of the Old Testament. They would have chalked Jesus up, like I said earlier, to another failed Messiah and gone on with their Jewish beliefs. Yeah, that's that's very interesting, and I didn't, I didn't like kind of draw a connection between more progressive Christianity, which does, as you say, like separate the cause of Jesus from the claims of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll ask. So you mentioned how there were other failed messiahs, and how the followers of those failed messiahs don't end up preaching him, but they just recognize, oh, you know, he was kind of like what the Emaus disciples said, like, we wanted, we hoped he would be the coming Messiah, but then they kind of carry on with their lives mm. and continue fishing or whatever. But I think it's Dr. Richard Carrier who says, um, you're going to have to have some kind of almost unprecedented explanation for, G for the origins of Christianity, whether it's a resurrection or some kind of unlikely hallucination Whatever it is, it's going to have a low prior probability because the flourishing of Christianity has a low prior probability as well. And so, I don't know, what do you think of that? Like, you, if you say, oh, the disciples, even though Jesus wasn't really the Messiah, the disciples had this different response from other disciples of other failed messiahs. And the reason they did that was just because Christianity is so different. Do, do you think that even, like, begins to explain it? So I agree with Carrier, as you described it, that we're going to need a very significant explanation for the origin of the Christian faith. Given uh, claims that there was a resurrection in the middle of history, given the claim that a Messiah would die and be buried and rise on the third day, that has broad precedent within Judaism, but is not explicitly laid out, given the growth of Christianity, given uh, the willingness of many to suffer and die for this belief, uh, he's right that it requires a significant explanation. Now, the one that I think I heard you offer was, yeah, there's these failed messiahs, but Christianity was different, so it flourished. That doesn't strike me as remotely enough to convince Paul and James and the apostles to start proclaiming this message because, oh, this message is different. In fact, today... One of the things with social media and news is everybody's just looking for a different message, right? If it's shocking, you get views. If it's different, you get attention. Write some, you know, shocking hypothesis about, you know, the Da Vinci Code years ago, and a ton of people will read it. Well, that's not what people were thinking in the first century. They were thinking, how do they just survive the oppression of Rome? And how do they stay faithful to this Jewish message? So this, the idea that the Christian message was just different than other failed messiahs was enough to be an impetus. I mean, that doesn't strike me as being close to explain the origin of the Christian faith. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. And to be fair, I don't think Dr. Carrier would express it in quite that way. Um, mm. I, I wanted to ask one more thing that's still related to this option four. You said if Paul, like Rahab, had a commitment to the God of Israel, then he would have seen you know, Christ crucified and thought, oh, that's not Christ crucified. That's, you know, a criminal crucified, a false messiah. And so he wouldn't, you know, he, he wouldn't even, like his ultimate commitment would actually preclude um, a, a proclamation of Christianity. I think that's a very insightful um, insight. Um, I would just wonder, maybe that applies to Paul, but if we're talking about the disciples of Jesus who followed him for a few years, Instead of thinking about their commitment to the God of Israel, what if we think, oh, their commitment to Christ? They were so devoted to Christ, and they, they really believed he was the Messiah. Maybe they had a stronger conviction than other, you know, failed messiahs, maybe because Jesus was reputed to be an, uh, an amazing miracle worker. For, for whatever reason, they had this strong commitment to Christ. And so when he died, their commitment to Christ, you know, I guess motivated them to this th this lie of the resurrection. Again, I I, I just suggest this as a possibility because I yeah. want to you know I'm curious to see what you think. I I love it. Such good questions. What you're trying to do is go down every rabbit trail and see where they see where they lead. So some of the other followers of these false messiahs also endeared them as well. We just don't have the record of how much they loved them and followed them and believed in them, or at least as much of a record, because they didn't grow in the way that Christianity did. So it's not unique to Christianity that the followers had devout passion to them. In fact, given the oppression in Rome at this time, when anybody came forward and seemed promising, this is what they were living for. So that's not unique to Christianity. Still doesn't explain why these followers said he was risen and other followers didn't. Still doesn't answer that question. But then we'd also have to ask, what was the message of Jesus? So if they have devotion to him, then that would seemingly imply follow what Jesus taught. Well, what did Jesus teach? Well, obviously the gospel accounts and Paul consistently teach that he was God in human flesh, that he lived a sinless life, that he would die and raise on the third day. Now, clearly they just don't get it. I mean, this is predicted three times in Mark, eight, nine, and 10 predicts that he's dying. And the apostles don't get it until they look back and they see what was present through a new lens. So I guess in some, them loving Jesus wouldn't be enough still to suffer and die and proclaim that he was a Messiah. If they knew it was false, I still don't think it gets there. It would have been much more easy and natural for at least some of them to say, like you cited very well, the passage in Luke, uh, we thought he was the one, but he wasn't. That's exactly how they would have responded. And they could have continued on in their lives. This kind of thing happened somewhat regularly in that culture at that time. That, that's good. Um, one more thing. Uh, still on this point, Dr. Dale Allison, you, you, said, you said their love of Christ would have to kind of be consistent with what Christ taught. And what Dr. Dale Allison would say, and I think he would agree with most conservative scholars here, is... Um, that Christ predicted his passion in you know Mark nine and ten, Mark eight nine and ten, um, elsewhere in I think Matthew he talks about I will you know I will destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days, you know all, all these things. And so what Dr. Allison says is that this concept of Jesus, you know, kind of defeat in a sense his passion and his resurrection, it was already in the minds like that concept was in the minds of the apostles because it came from the lips of Jesus himself. And, you know, what do you think? Do you think that's even, I don't know if that's even relevant to this discussion, but it's just something I remembered of his. Yeah, so the concept was there, like you said, Mark 8, 9, and 10. There's multiple, it's multiply attested that Jesus predicted his death. So he taught in it. I think that's undeniable. The question is, why don't the disciples understand it? Why don't they get it? 
And I think in part because they had a faulty view of what the Messiah would be. And we see this, I believe it's in Mark chapter 10, where James and John are like, can we reign with you on your right and your left? And Jesus is like, I've already told you that I'm going to die. He doesn't say that, but I know that's essentially what he's thinking. The heart of the question is, why don't they understand it? And so, yes, I think Jesus taught that. And so loving him would be consistent with what he taught. Doesn't fall that it's therefore fabricated and didn't happen and we can't trust the accounts. I think it just means when Jesus shows up, he so radically transforms their perspective. They look back and go, oh my goodness, now I actually get it. All right, that's fair. That's fair. So to summarize this one, we can move on. Um, but to summarize this, Option four is an implausible motivation for the apostles' willingness to suffer because their prior commitment to the God of Israel and even their prior commitment to Christ would preclude this sort of mass deception and lie about a resurrection. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's a good summary. If they found out that he was a false messiah, what they naturally would have done is gone on with their lives, proclaimed him another false messiah, and then look for the real Messiah. That's what was built into Judaism at the time, and they don't. That's what requires an explanation. And the explanation they give and are willing to suffer for is Jesus actually appeared to us. He's risen from the grave. Awesome. So this last option, uh, we can talk about this, and then we, if we have time, um, we can talk about some of our actual evidence in the Apostolic Fathers. But this fifth option is perhaps the apostles were driven by other selfish uh, incentives, such as sex, money, or power, or maybe in this case, authority, that were seen to be worth the risk of death. Um, so maybe, or, or persecution, or, or mockery, or suffering. So maybe an analogy might be Joseph Smith. Um, I remember mm -hmm. one of the first videos I watched or one of the when I was studying Mormonism and the origins of Mormonism, one of the first videos I watched was a video on your channel with an expert on a Protestant expert on Mormonism, and I, I learned about like the Book of Abraham, how we actually found the Egyptian manuscripts um, from from which you know Joseph Smith translated he he translated them into the Book of Mormon, but we found this the manuscripts and really they're Egyptian seer scrolls and they have nothing to do with the Book of Abraham. So I think that demonstrates, you know, his motivation is not sincerity. He, he's probably not sincere and genuine, but he's still willing to proclaim this kind of new message that was hated by the outside world. He was pushed out of his state. He was, you know, he was targeted by the, a, a governor at one point and he was incarcerated. So there were all these consequences for his proclamation, but he wasn't doing it because he was sincere. There were probably selfish motives, such as sex, money, or power. And if we apply, if we try to apply this to the apostles, I don't think it would be sex. I don't think it would be money because they were they were poor, and Paul probably <laughs> wasn't even married. Um, it might be something like authority, authority in this new, um, in this new kind of movement. I, I suspect the the most obvious response to that might be. Until the third or fourth century, Christianity wasn't this powerful movement. It was mm. a very small, persecuted minority. And so this authority, you know, this relative authority that they could gain wouldn't be enough in their eyes to be willing to face persecution. So, yeah, that's just the response that comes to mind. But what would you say about that? This is a great question, and I think it's uh, fair to compare the apostles with Joseph Smith. Now, I might say, I think the book of Abraham shows pretty clearly that Joseph Smith was a false prophet. I'm not sure it proves he was necessarily insincere about what he believed. Minimally, it showed that he's a false prophet and got it wrong. Maybe he really thought he had the powers to translate this document and deliver it in a certain fashion. I mean, I'm just not certain that alone proves the lack of sincerity, although I think it shows pretty definitively he's a false prophet. Interesting. So 
when and I'd have to think about that a little bit more, but that's my initial reaction. I'm trying to be charitable. When it comes to the question of another motivation, I think you mentioned sex, power, and money. This is where my friend Jay Werner Wallace is super helpful. Now, he's not a biblical scholar, he's not a PhD. He's a cold case detective. So he's never lost a case in, I don't know, 30 some years. And I'm appealing to him as an authority here because he is one of the most foremost experts on the law and motivations that criminals have for invent. There it is for inventing things that are false. And he says in every case he's ever done, it's either sex, power or money or sex, lust, power, authority, money. Let's compare the apostles with Joseph Smith. So let's take the, the issue of sex. Well, if you start with Jesus, he would still pass the Me Too movement. He was single and by all accounts only showed dignity and respect and care for women, period. You look, so if they're following after Jesus, this clearly isn't a movement to get the ladies. That's obvious in that culture at that time. Well, Joseph Smith had somewhere between 25 and 48, probably around 33 wives, including a sister pair, a mother-daughter pair, all sorts of illicit relationships. So there is a component of sex that applies to him that wouldn't to Jesus, and we have any evidence for the apostles. Take, uh, what was the second one? Power, sex, let's take money. It's not that Jesus was necessarily poor. He might have been somewhat middle class or lower middle class as a carpenter. But this is not a movement about getting money. In fact, Jesus talks about giving to the poor. The apostles in Acts, they say, and remember, care for the poor. So this is not a movement that is going to make money. If anything, they're suffering because of the movement, getting thrown in prison, etc. Well, Joseph Smith was he gave a prophecy, I believe it was, or at least promised his followers that he would start a bank and God would bless it, control it himself, but then it went under and it failed. So again, there's very different motivations that are here. When it comes to power, what does Jesus do? He washes the feet of his disciples. He lays down his life. He commissions Peter and says, be a shepherd as I was in John 21, which I think clearly means lead with the tenderness that I did with a willingness to lay down your life for the flock. So Jesus turned power on its head in the exact opposite of the way it was practiced by Rome. Rome used power to oppress, to control, to expand their territory. Jesus said, I willingly lay down my life as an act of love and called his apostles to as well. So I, I, the kind of power that was exercised is a very different kind of power than, you know, even today, or like you said in the fourth century or later when it comes to Constantine and the authority that was there. Yet when it comes to Joseph Smith, he wanted to run for president. He was seeking after power. Now, that doesn't mean he was necessarily lying, but to compare the two together, I think, does a disservice to the difference of the apostles and the message they taught and to Joseph Smith. And by the way, maybe this has taken us too far aside, but Joseph Smith is frequently referred to as a martyr. You see it in Doctrine and Covenants 135, that he was innocent and would be led to the slaughter when he was arrested like a lamb was taken. Uh, you see Brigham Young referring to the found the one who took Mormonism and moved the Mormons to Salt Lake City after Joseph Smith, him distinctly referring to Joseph Smith as a martyr. Well, there's two reasons why I just don't I don't buy it. One is Joseph Smith took a gun and defended himself. Now, I'm not saying he didn't have the right to do that when he was arrested in Nauvoo in 1844. He had a right to do that. But if you're going to bring a weapon and kill some other people attacking him, it raises the question whether or not you are a martyr. Second, there's good reason to think he wasn't innocent. 
the Nauvoo, I can't remember if it was called the Expositor or the paper that time in Illinois, was going to print an article critiquing Joseph Smith and his followers for being illicit. And he got a gang of his followers to go destroy the press. So he's guilty, arguably, of not only destroying the press, but at least likely some of the charges that were being raised against him. So I just don't buy this comparison. Now it's raised a lot. For example, Dale Allison raised it again in his book on the resurrection of Jesus, I think in the section where he was responding to my book. And on the surface, because the Book of Mormon starts with the three witnesses and the eight witnesses, and it's claimed that Joseph Smith died as a martyr, it appears to be comparable to the claim that I'm making. That's where the devil is in the details. And I think it starts to fall apart when we look more closely. So bottom line, I guess, is summary. If we're going to say there's some motivation, we can invent some motivation. People do that all the time. I want to know what is the best possible motivation. And I have no reason to think the apostles were in this for money. No reason to think it was about sex or lust. And no reason to think it was about a power, especially the way that Jesus characterized what it meant to exercise power well. Yeah, I think that those are all wonderful points. Um, you have about an hour um, for this, right? Uh, yeah, but go ahead. I don't want to. I don't want to cut short. You're asking great, great questions. Yeah. So okay, great. Um, I have maybe one more follow up, and then we'll kind of come to the conclusion. Um, the you know the little conclusion of these videos. So uh, about yeah, sex and money. I don't. I don't think those even begin to qualify as a possible motivation for the earliest apostolic proclamations. Um, I would say just authority, I, I don't think it's more plausible than sincerity that they were, you know, lying to gain authority, but it's something that I've thought about. You know, Jesus had authority in a sense, and his his idea of power was kneeling down and washing people's feet. I understand that. Mm -hmm. So if we move from Jesus and we look at the apostles, you know, they were in command of the church. They could appoint people. You know, they appointed Stephen and like a few other people to, to oversee. And then they would leave and they would start churches. And Paul said to imitate me as I imitate Christ. He's like, you know, the example of how to live a good life. And so, you know, that, that doesn't mean they're malicious, but there is that there. Do you think there even could be that motivation of power, which would kind of drive what they say? If I were to invent a motivation and go with the one apart from sincerity, it would probably be this one. Because people can create even their small kingdoms for a sake of personal authority and power. That can happen. But I just have a hard time believing that's true for all of them in light of still mm. what it cost them in the culture. And that nobody would correct the other person's use of power I mean, this in part is what Paul is doing to Peter in his letter saying, hey, what are you doing? You're playing favorites here with the Jews over the Gentiles. This is not right. And this is not fitting to the gospel. So they're human. I'm sure at some point they enjoyed being a part of the 12 and having some authority. Like I think it'd be crazy to say that that wasn't an element of it, but that that's the motivating factor to preach a message that gets them beaten, thrown in prison, killed, an enemy of the state, that little modicum of power of a new struggling movement just doesn't strike me as sufficient to explain what we know about them. That's definitely fair. Um, I, I think one more point that my friend Kelton, he's a one of Jehovah's Witnesses, he mentioned this hmm. about how he thinks sincerity has, I guess, greater precedent. Like for the other four, you can I, I did give an example here or there of a certain person or a certain kind of criminal that would be an example of these. But with sincerity, I mean, in the vast majority of cases where you can establish that someone is willing to voluntarily suffer for what they, what they at least claim to believe, it's because they actually believe it. I mean, even for, for Muslims or for Buddhists who are willing to sacrifice themselves, most of us can't agree it's because of sincerity. Or Joan of Arc, who was willing to 
you know, t- to die for, for what she claimed about how God was speaking to her, she was probably genuine. And he pointed out how there were thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses in um, concentration camps during the Holocaust. Mm. And, I, you know, he, he sent me some academic, um, he sent me some scholarly articles about it. And it's like, it's clear that they are sincere, they're genuine. Jehovah's Witnesses were actually allowed to leave. They could actually leave the concentration camp wow. whenever they wanted if they signed a document that said, I, I renounce, you know, I renounce this mm. demonic sect or whatever. And, but very few of them did. A few dozen out of a few thousand did. So, you know, you look at examples like that throughout all of history and you realize sincerity has a greater precedent than the other four. Do you, you think that's a, that's a powerful argument? I think that's well said. Here's the piece I would qualify it. I haven't really studied Joan of Arc, and this is the first I've heard of these Jehovah's Witnesses in World War II, so I'll take your friend's uh, uh, word on it. Sounds reasonable to me. This is why we have to go back and say, what is the person sincere about? So those Jehovah's Witnesses were sincere about their faith and willing to suffer for it. Uh, Same with, say, Muslims. Uh, in 9-11, willing to suffer and die for that faith. But that has no evidential significance to me any more than if somebody says, hey, Sean, do you believe this? And I die as a martyr. All that shows is I'm sincere. So evidentially speaking, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims, and myself, if we're willing to suffer and die for it, are probably on the same level. But the apostles aren't sharing something that had been passed down to them for centuries from others, third, fourth, fifth, sixth hand. They're saying, we have seen the risen Jesus. And they're still willing to testify as witnesses for this. They are in a different epistemic position than people centuries removed from the claims themselves. And they're the ones that pass on this tradition. They're the ones that first write some of the Gospels and, of course, Paul, the letters of Paul, uh, his letters. So in principle, I agree with you, but I still think there's a difference that I might draw out. Yeah, that's a fair qualification. Um, So maybe in these last few minutes, um, we can kind of wrap it up and do this little conclusion I have. I'm planning to ask these three quick questions to all the every guest at the end of every episode. So, okay. Um, we, we don't have to go too in-depth. I'm just curious to see what, you know, what these answers are. So what's one significant thing you've changed your mind on, whether from research or experience or discussions? Well, maybe I'll focus on the apostles since this has been our topic, if that's okay. So I published my, dis- my uh, dissertation. It was 2014. The book came out in 2015. And that was seven years ago, eight years ago from the time that we're having this conversation. And there's a few things I've changed my mind. Number one, I probably would assess James, the son of Zebedee, one notch down. And -hmm. that's because we have one good source for James in the book of Acts. I think the reliability of Acts, I think the way it's phrased, as Keener said, it just reads like an execution account. There's no flowery details. Now we have no tradition of anything else that happened to James, and we have other corroboration and later writings. So I think we're on very solid historical ground, but I probably put that a little higher than it should be given one source. That's one I would revisit. Uh, Second, interestingly enough, is I concluded with most scholars that Peter was probably crucified. I missed something, Nahoa. I can't believe I missed this. It seems so obvious is shortly after my dissertation came out, Larry Hurtado edited a book on Peter. And he said, one thing we know about crucifixion is that crucifixion victims were stripped bare to utterly shame and humiliate them. Yet John 21, the debated passage where it says his hands would be spread out, I took that as referring to crucifixion. It also says he would be clothed by another. But that's not how somebody would die of crucifixion being clothed. So that tells me he, I think almost certainly, historically speaking, died as a martyr, but probably not crucified, let alone crucified upside down. So I would amend that. A third one, this is smaller, is uh, I chalked up 
the Acts of Paul, which is written at the end of the second century, it describes Paul being beheaded and milk secreting from his neck. The Acts of Paul has like Paul baptizing a lion and this milk coming from his neck. So I just chalk that up to kind of myth apocryphal writings. And a doctor contacted me and he said, hey, Sean, there's actually precedent in the medical world of under stress, a milk type substance secreting from the neck. Now I can't prove that happened to Paul, but if I go back and do that, I would actually research that and try to find out if there's any precedent for that. And maybe in this case, I concluded something was legend when it wasn't. So that's the good thing about making your arguments public. You get pushback, uh, research continues, and you amend it according to where the best arguments are. Yeah, that's so cool. I didn't know any of that um, about hmm. James, son of Zebedee. That was probably the only thing in your whole 400 something page dissertation I disagreed with. I also would say it's. Oh, like, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. It's okay. like one notch down, I'd say. I, okay. I, I think the evidence for Peter and Paul is a little stronger. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Good. Yeah. And then I didn't know that about the milk, like the milk like substance, kind of like how when Jesus was sweating, um, how Jesus sweat blood, or how when, you know, a spear was put through his side, like water came out, how there's medical evidence that's kind of relevant to that. I, I you know, I know there's textual problems there, but uh, yeah, that's there also are, really yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's that's yeah. interesting. Okay. Um, next question, what's maybe a personal factor, something that doesn't constitute mm. propositional evidence that influences your worldview? So let me tie this to my studies a little bit. One of the things I really tried to do was weed out my personal bias, wanting this argument to work versus where the evidence points to. So when I wrote my dissertation, I assessed a few of the disciples even higher than I do in my academic book. And I was talking with Michael Cohn about this because I got pushback from one scholar and he said, Sean, assess the evidence the way a Muslim or an atheist would. Do your best to enter into their worldview and assess it that way. And I thought, you know what? That's a really helpful discipline. And I went back to the evidence and reassessed a handful of them and realized even for myself, I was eager to advance this argument more so than just say, where exactly does the evidence point? And I think mm. in the academic book itself, I arrived at that, even though now I would have the one qualification probably with James, that was a part of the process that I didn't even realize I was aware of until I got some peer review and pushback from scholars. Uh, for me, the other stuff I think about is my job is obviously tied to my worldview. I teach at Biola University. So if I gave up belief in uh, pro-life, if I gave up belief in inerrancy, uh, I would not teach at Biola anymore. So I've had a lot of conversations with my wife and with myself about this and ultimately have to rest and say, my integrity is all that matters at the end of the day. And I have no plans to do this, but I've even thought through if I had a different career not related to ministry, what I would do. I literally have it charted out, but I don't plan on doing that. But I have to be honest that that does affect, uh, that's at least a piece that could prevent me from following truth if I'm not careful and I'm not wise about it. I think my family, I have so much love and respect for my father that it's not lost on me, that if I gave up my faith, how painful that would be to him. Uh, but I even told my dad when I questions when I was younger, I said, I'm not sure I buy this. And Noho, you and I have had this conversation and he's committed to loving me no matter what, he didn't freak out. But that certainly affects my worldview. Um, I think about death. And if I change my belief in the resurrection, would that face the way that I confront death? So when you ask what affects my worldview, I think there's emotional, there's financial, there's relational, there's a ton of factors. And I think the only way to mitigate this is to be honest with myself, to have a lot of conversations with people who see the world differently, which I do regularly on my show. I read a ton of books. And when it's all said and done, just try to make sure I have integrity in my life and my scholarship. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, we're not just 
syllogism machines that think purely in terms of arguments. <laughs> um, there, there's other factors, and I think that's that's very helpful. Thanks for sharing that. Um, lastly, just any final thoughts, resources on the subject, advice to me, advice to other truth seekers. Just you know, how do you want to wrap this up? Oh, gosh, Noah, I am so proud of you. Getting to know you and be a part of your journey has been a huge blessing for me and your whole family over the past couple of years. Keep seeking after truth. Keep asking questions. Uh, I think the future is super bright for you. I'm here on camera, off camera to help and just really look forward to see uh, the way you know your future plays out. And I, I think God's hand on your life. So those of you watching this, you know, if Christianity really is true, then it can withstand the toughest challenges. I think what we have to do in light of your last question is be really intentional about our worldviews and make sure we're not believing or not believing for emotional or moral or some other issue, but falling after what is true. And to me, when I keep coming back to the person of Jesus, his unique claims about who he was, the miracles, I think good evidence for the resurrection and the apostles' willingness to suffer and die, which again, doesn't prove that this is true. But to me, it shows they really believed they had seen the risen Jesus. I think the evidence is there. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. I'll probably have to do the obligatory... If you're watching this, please subscribe, like this video, comment. It's good for engagement, I think. Um, so, yeah, I, we have more interviews planned. Um, I plan to talk with Dr. Um, Dale Allison soon, Dr. Andrew Loke, Dr. Craig Blomberg, Dr. Craig Evans, e even maybe Dr. Michael Lacona and others. So, yeah, that's coming up soon. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. Peace. You bet.